Okay, we'll probably get started with our next session. I want to welcome you back. And I want to thank the Bismarck Hotel and Conference Center for the delicious lunch. And now I would like to introduce Myron Duke, who is sharing with us his thoughts on calibration of the water resiliency. Marlon Duke serves as Deputy Regional Director of the Bureau of Reclamation, Missouri Basin and Arkansas, Rio Grande, Texas Gulf regions. Prior to his current position, he served as the Public Affairs Officer for Reclamation of the Upper Colorado Basin region, where he led engagement and communications for the Bureau's projects, facilities, and drought response initiatives along the Upper Colorado River. He also served as a Reclamation Chief of Public Affairs in Washington, D.C. Marin is experienced includes serving as Director of Communications for the Transportation Security Administration Office of Human Capital and serving as Strategic Planning Director for U.S. Coast Guard Headquarters for the Services Activation Organization, where he led communications and congressional affairs for his $30 billion recapitalization program. Where I also worked for General Dynamics Information Technology, Inc., and Policy Impact Communications. I give you Marin Duke. How is everybody? I feel like maybe we ought to do jumping jacks or something after lunch. Get the blood flowing again. Uh, it's great to be here today. Um, great to be here today. Thanks for welcoming us uh, here to Bismarck. I was here a year ago. I feel like I need to apologize just a little bit because uh, you were supposed to get my boss today, um, Brent Esplin, who's the regional director. Uh, but he had some scheduling conflicts come up, and so you, you have to deal with me two years in a row. Um, my apologies for that. But it is great to be here. I think last year when I was here this week for this conference, it was like 20 below and uh, two feet of snow outside. And uh, I, I like the springtime weather much, much better. Yesterday, I didn't even have to put my jacket on. Um, but it's going to get us to where we, I want to talk a little bit about the hydrology. And we're seeing some of, you know, this year, things have been warmer. I, I live in Montana. I live in Billings, Montana. And things are warmer there, too. It was almost 70 degrees there yesterday um, when I called and talked to my wife. So things have been warmer. They've been a little bit drier uh, this year. And so as we monitor in reclamation, as we monitor the basin, and we monitor the tributaries and, and a snowpack, uh, it's still early, but, but we're, we're getting a little bit more focused on maybe what comes next and hoping, hoping things come a little bit quicker. Before I get there, I want to thank the reclamation staff from Dakota's area office who are here and, and helping me today. There's a bunch of them back here. All of you stand up. So I know, I know that uh, the water users in the state here that you work with our reclamation staff a lot. Uh, we want to be useful and beneficial partners for you. Uh, you. One of the things I talk about when I travel around, and, and I've been a little bit on, on these water conference circuits last week. I was actually with uh, uh, not with, but saw Danny Quizzle down at the Oklahoma Governor's Water Conference in outside of Oklahoma City. A couple weeks before that, I was in San Antonio for the Texas Water Conservation Association Conference. Uh, next week, I will be in Las Vegas for the Colorado River Water Users Association Conference. And, and so as we travel around and, and we talk to folks and we talk to our partners, one of the things I talk a lot about is, is how we, in Reclamation, especially here in this region, we want to be support partners. Our water challenges and our water solutions uh, need to be locally and state-led and with, with us and on the federal side supporting as, as we can. So, so that's a relationship we want. We want to be collaborative uh, and, and work with you to achieve the water solutions that we need to here in the state and for us in the regional office across the region as well. Um, let's maybe talk for just a minute about uh, the funding that comes through the Bureau of Reclamation for uh, water-related projects uh, here in the state. We have a lot of funding opportunities right now. I know you've heard a lot about the bipartisan infrastructure law, um, the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, money that's coming to the Bureau of Reclamation and other federal agencies uh, to, to put out locally. So these are, these are numbers uh, from 2023. Uh, just to give you an idea of, of how, and this is, this is all the area office staff, um, our, our Dakota's area office staff working with, with all of you to make this money available and, and get it out to where you need it on the projects here in the state. So in 2023, uh, Reclamation provided $20 million for operation and maintenance of, of facilities here in the state, $16 million for construction appropriations. This comes out of our normal appropriation line. Um, and if you've been watching the, uh, 
the entertainment that's going on in Washington with our appropriations bill. Like we are, uh, we're kind of hoping that we come in January and we have an appropriations bill. We can keep some of this, keep this going without, without much of a hiccup. We're making plans that way. Uh, the, the bipartisan infrastructure law. Um, this, this provided big buckets of money for us and our commissioner and, and the secretary talked about that in terms of a, a once in a generation kind of funding from the, fund, from the federal level. I know uh, in most of our careers, we haven't seen this kind of funding coming in from the federal government across the West. So, so this has been a big deal for us and, and we've been working with local water entities here in the state to make this money available. In 2023, uh, we were able to provide 57, almost $58 million for rural water projects here in the state. $80 million. We've talked several times here at the conference about aging infrastructure in the state. It's the same all across the West. Uh, but here in North Dakota, we were happy to be able to provide $80 million in 2023 for aging infrastructure projects. And uh, $1.3 million uh, for other things that's like recreation upgrades um, at facilities, things like that. So that brings that, that total in 2023 from the Bureau of Reclamation to North Dakota entities of about $175.2 million. Uh, and we're working for 2024, 2025, uh, within the Bureau of Reclamation right now, we're working on our 2026 budget. And so uh, we, we got money in for, for projects similar to this as we move forward as well. Uh, the deadline for us to submit aging infrastructure applications under bill uh, was just last Friday. And those are, uh, those are being considered now within Reclamation as well. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about what we see in the regional office and across reclamation in terms of uh, collaborating for water resilience. But before I do that, I thought maybe we'd spend a little bit of time too talking about where we are hydrologically in the basin as we track the snowpack uh, and, and look to the spring and, and what's, what's perhaps coming our way in terms of water supply for 2024. So I'll show you a number of these bell curves. Um, again, it's early in the season, so, uh, so it's probably too early to get too excited or or too worried about anything, but overall, we're a little bit down from, from where we were last year and where we would want to be on average. If you look at this, the, the red line is average for snowpack. The green line is what we experienced in 2023, and that blue line is where we are right now. Uh, so you can see that's the, the Jefferson River over in, over in Montana, how things are trending right now. The Madison River is about the same, and uh, we've got some percentages. So if I go back, the Jefferson, uh, right, th these numbers are based on um, the, the snow tail modeling that we got on Monday, uh, the 4th of December. So for the Jefferson, uh, that represents 70% of median for that date. And if you're comparing the water year 2024, where we are right now, to where we were at this time in water year 2023, uh, the Jefferson is about 49% of where it was a year ago, as far as snowpack. There's the Madison. Uh, it also is sitting at about 49% of where it was a year ago and 79% of median, what we would expect as median for the state. The Gallatin River, also over in Montana, it's doing a little bit better. It's about 56% of where it was at this time last year. The upper Yellowstone is at 66% of where it was last year and 78% of median for this time of year. It gets a little bit better when we go down to Wyoming and, and some of the mountain ranges in Wyoming, they've gotten more snow uh, so far this season. The Bighorn, you can see spiked earlier in the season and, uh, and now is riding just about where it was a year ago. The Bighorn percent median right now is 104% and 20, this year, 2024 versus where it was last year is 99% uh, where we were a year ago. The, the Shoshone River, uh, similarly doing better there in Wyoming. Uh, percent of median right now is 107%, and 2024 to 2020 to last year is 101%. So those are helping us out. Uh, the main, the Missouri River main stem, uh, our snow tail sites and our, our monitoring there along there, right now is 56% of median for this time of year. And uh, comparing to a year ago right now is 49% of where we were a year ago. So, um, and that's just a snapshot of what's happening hydrologically right now in the basin as we, as we monitor, and, and a lot of things could happen. When I was here last year, we, uh, we talked a lot about what was going on in the Colorado River, and I remember then, uh, based on the modeling numbers, we were showing that uh, Lake Mead 
uh, at the time was risking, it looked like the modeling showed that they were going to risk dropping below power pool uh, within about 24 months. And then if you remember, that really big winter came through um, after we were here for this conference, and, and those numbers got completely blown out of the water. So, um, so lots can happen. We're early in the season. A lot can happen, and, and we can see some storms come in and change things pretty quick. So um, that's all the slides I have. I'm going to talk for, for just a little bit longer about, about some things. Uh, just to give you an idea what's, what we're working on uh, here at the area office for reclamation at the regional level and, and across the Bureau. Uh, I was in Washington, D.C. Joe Hall, uh, the area manager here in Bismarck, was with us uh, several weeks ago. We were in Washington, D.C. We met on Capitol Hill um, with uh, some of our congressional staffers. We met with our commissioner. We met with the assistant secretary's office and talked about water needs across the region. They are very interested and very concerned about making sure that we get these resources that have been made available to us out to where they're needed here on the ground. And we share those concerns. Uh, numbers that I shared with you earlier, uh, we're very happy that we're able to provide that funding and thank Congress for it. Uh, we're working internally within reclamation to, to try our best to, to be a little bit more efficient about how we do that and, and how we get through some of the seed bumps uh, that we have because we are the federal government. And, um, but we, we want to do, do that better. I'm going to come back to that theme of, of state-led and federally supported water solutions. And, and we want to be that beneficial partner and we recognize that Part of being that beneficial partner is making sure we can make those resources available to you uh, when you need them and, and work, through, work through the challenges of making, making that available. So uh, when I was here last year, like I said, we talked a lot about what was going on in the Colorado River uh, and maybe some lessons that we could learn from, from our sister basin over the mountains. Uh, after that, we, uh, we had an opportunity to meet with a number of other federal agencies. Uh, I represent reclamation along with Brent S. our regional director, we represent reclamation on the Missouri River Interagency Roundtable, uh, which is a group of federal agencies uh, meets periodically through each year to, to come to the table and, and talk about issues and challenges going on within the river basin. It's federal agencies that work all along the Missouri River Basin. Um, you know, it's us, it's Fish and Wildlife Service, it's Forest Service, it's uh, the Park Service, USGS, um, EPA, uh, even the Coast Guard is involved for some of the things that they do down on the lower part of the river. Anyway, uh, we meet regularly and we talk about themes and we talk about issues and challenges uh, that we want to collaborate on together and, and, and really work together to come up with solutions. Um, last February, we were hosting a meeting and we took all of those executives from those federal agencies to Boulder City, Nevada. And we had two and a half days of meetings uh, at an, in an office that sits out over the Hoover Dam. And we talked about drought. And we talked about what was happening right there, uh, literally under our feet at that meeting, as we were looking at Hoover Dam and Lake Mead. And we talked about what do we do as federal agencies if something similar were to happen in our basin? What would we do if, uh, if we had historic drought? And in this basin, we've had periods of drought, periods of wet, um, and they come and go. But what would we do if we got into sustained drought for a decade? Or like the Colorado River uh, now, more than two decades? How would we work together to resolve and to, to come up with solutions? And so that was, that was kind of the theme of those meetings. And, and what we came out of there with is a, is a new or a renewed partnership uh, between the agencies to work towards some drought-related resilience, uh, some solutions for water resilience in the basin. And I'll get to that in a little bit more in a few minutes. So looking at our river uh, here, your river, uh, it's a crucial, crucial resource, um, a life-sustaining, life-providing resource from the headwaters in Montana, uh, here through North Dakota, all the way down through until it, until it meets up with the Mississippi River. The longest river in North America, um, 95 significant tributaries, a drainage area of almost 530,000 square miles, it's a, it's a complex watershed, and I know you know that, um, and so we don't need to get into a whole, whole lot of discussion about the complexities in the basin and, and how we work together to resolve challenges and, and find solutions. But maybe, uh, and this was the theme that, that we came up with uh, in those Missouri River Roundtable meetings, is, is maybe we learn from the, the good things that we're doing here in this basin, along with some of the good ideas and the lessons from some of our sister basins who 
have been perhaps experiencing challenges on a greater scale than, than we have here. So there's some examples. Um, out in Washington State, uh, the Yakima River Basin in central Washington is one that is historically fraught with controversy and uh, complexity. It serves about 400,000 people there in Washington. Um, it supplies water for a four and a half billion dollar agriculture industry. Uh, it's been suffering, like all the other river basins, through these changing weather patterns of you know more intense dry seasons that have been threatening its aquifers. Its snowpack has dwindled. Uh, they've had clashes with litigation with water users, state entities, tribes, um, environmental interests have, have been fighting over how to allocate the resources of that river. Uh, one of the things that they did after, after an extremely dry period in the 1970s, uh, Congress acted, the state went to Congress, Congress acted, and they implemented the Yakima Basin Water Enhancement Project, uh, which is a multi-phase project. Uh, they're in phase three right now. Phase one, uh, in phase one, Congress provided funding for uh, some environmental concerns, uh, endangered species concerns like fish ladders, screens, uh, those types of things along the river and the reservoirs. Uh, phase two focused on conservation and, and water supply. Uh, they're in phase three right now, which uh, brings together, they've developed a Yakima integrated plan, the Yakima Basin integrated plan. And what, what that does is it's a 30 year plan. It brings together the state, water users, uh, federal government, tribal interests, community interests together to, to plan uh, on a watershed based approach for, for how they're gonna take care of that resource and how they're gonna make sure that the resource is available out into the future for all of those needs. Um, and so they're implementing that plan right now through a collaborative approach. Uh, in the Central Valley in California, I know you just have to open up the newspaper or Google and, and find things that are happening out there. But that's, that's always been a controversial area too. Um, they perhaps don't collaborate as well as you do here in North Dakota. Uh, there's a lot more fighting that goes on there. We see it in the news, we see it in the courts. Uh, California goes from drought to flood, and drought to flood. And, and they're trying to figure that out right now. So what are some of the lessons maybe we can learn there to either repeat or not repeat here. We talked about the Colorado River and, and that's something that's on, on, on the news all the time now too and a lot of people are paying attention to what's going on in the Colorado uh, this year perhaps and last year than, than they were before. But there's 40 million people, 40 million people who rely on the, on the water from that river. Uh, what happens if, if we can't provide it? And we've talked and you've heard yesterday uh, from the state engineers how uh, the river is over allocated uh, there's more water on paper than there is in the river, and that's, that's contributed to, to some of these big, big challenges that they have there. But how, how have they gone about addressing that challenge? And we know it's not completely addressed, but there's some unique characteristics. We don't, we don't have a legal structure on the Missouri River like they do on the Colorado River. Uh, we don't have a main stem compact. Uh, there was some talk yesterday about, about compacts, and, and there's a lot of pros and cons um, about going down the road with a compact. But, uh, they have a compact that governs how the, how the water is allocated. Part of the challenges come from the compact itself. But here's some of the lessons that we've learned. And, and I mentioned last, last year that I, I talked to a lot of the Colorado River um, water buffaloes, if you will, about what they learned. And if they could go back to their selves 20 or 30 years ago with some lessons and things to look at, um, were there things that maybe they would have done different? And one of them told me that uh, you plan for the worst and then you all get in a room and you think, okay, what's going to be even worse than that? And then you put a plan for that extra worse thing. I don't know, how, I don't know the word for that. Uh, but you put, put together a plan for that and you, and you get it ready and you put it on the shelf. So that, so that when that comes, it, it's not biting your ankles when you're putting the plan together. But if it happens, you know what you're going to do. And you know how you're going to come together. Um, the Colorado has a unique role for the federal government too. Uh, one that doesn't exist in other basins, doesn't exist in this basin. Um, in the lower basin of the Colorado River, the Secretary of the Department of the Interior is the water master. And the Bureau of Reclamation exercises that role on the Secretary's behalf as, as the water master. So irrigators, um, irrigators in the lower Colorado Basin, they, they have contracts directly with Reclamation. And, and Reclamation controls um, the water that, that leaves those reservoirs. We don't have that relationship in other basins, nor do we want it. Um, it was a unique situation in the Colorado that, that made him go that direction. but. How do we, as a federal entity, work with you to make sure that we're ready if those challenges come? 
what, what do we do and, and how we do that. And hopefully, uh, we're working collaboratively with you. Um, one of the things that we've seen in the Colorado is the solutions that have been meaningful uh, haven't been federal solutions, by and large. They've been state-led solutions. The states coming together, bringing their ideas to the table, and then the federal government getting behind those ideas and helping them get it across the finish line. Uh, so for example, uh, back in 2019, they completed what they called the drought contingency plans. And we could spend all afternoon talking about that in another meeting. Um, but they, they worked for years, uh, the states did, with the federal government at the table, uh, worked for years on these drought contingency plans. And, and the idea was, uh, you know, there's a threshold of water behind Hoover Dam. And if that water, if the water drops below a certain level, uh, the law says that reclamation has to start reducing allocations to certain states. So the plan in the drought contingency plans was, uh, let's build a buffer in there so that we don't get to that legal level. Uh, the states came to the table and the lower basin states, Arizona, Nevada, and Mexico in particular, uh, came and said, we're going to give up some of our water uh, proactively, keep in the reservoir so that we don't get to that level. The upper basin states, uh, Utah, Wyoming, Colorado, and New Mexico, uh, said we're going to manage the water and the conservation in the upper basin uh, so that we make sure we meet flow obligations down south, uh, including um, releasing more water from some of the upper basin reservoirs so that it flowed down into Lake Powell. Uh, these were ideas that came from the states. And the, and the federal government sat at the table and, and, and we helped um, make those things a reality in terms of facilitating discussions. Uh, the way that was implemented, the states came together, they came to an agreement. Um, they worked on drafting legislative language because of the way the Colorado River is, is um, the, the legal structure on the river. We needed some congressional action to implement those drought contingency plans. The states worked together, they drafted legislation, they went to their congressional delegations with that legislation. They said, we all want this, we're behind this, let's make it happen. And then the congressional delegations took it from there and, and it passed Congress and was signed by President. Um, now where we could talk about those drought contingency plans gets back to the idea of plan for the worst and then going even worse than that. Uh, we thought that that was gonna give us a buffer um, of, of several years and within about 18 months, um, we had already blown through that buffer because of the way the the hydrology way out there. So uh, it didn't plan for as bad as, as Mother Nature sent our way. But the, but the main idea that I wanted to convey is that the, the real meaningful ideas, the real meaningful solutions are coming from the states. They're coming from the water users. They're coming from the people on the ground who are using and managing that resource at the ground level every single day. That's where those ideas are coming from and that's where they're the most meaningful. And so when we talk about state-led and federally supported water solutions, that's what I mean, is, is working with you, working across the state to come up with those solutions, come up with what we need to do so that if we get in those dire circumstances in this river basin, we already have a plan and we've been working together long enough that we know what our next steps are. Um, in this basin, uh, we, we mentioned there's not a, there's not a legal structure like there are in, in other basins like the Colorado. Uh, there have been some attempts in the past, and I know that uh, a lot of you are familiar with, with the attempts to, to come up with some sort of a legal structure uh, to do things like protect state water rights and, and allocations and things like that. In, in 1945, uh, there was an attempt at the Missouri Basin Interagency Committee, which included four federal agencies, four states. Um, it grew to seven, agency, seven federal agencies and 10 basin states. Um, it was a voluntary confederation uh, brought together to talk about and, and work on solutions. It didn't have power for policy, uh, but it was really a, a, a forum for discussion and collaboration. Uh, there was an attempt in the 1950s uh, to create a Missouri River compact. Uh, it was short-lived. Uh, the states came together, they, they had some discussions about it, talked about it, and uh, the governors decided to, to drop that initiative in 1955. Uh, so it was, it was shortly of President Nixon in 1972 uh, created the Missouri River Basin Commission as another opportunity to bring, to bring the states together to collaborate um, in, a, in a formal setting. Uh, that was also disbanded um, nine years later by Ronald Reagan when he was president. Um, so there's been, there's been attempts. Uh, there are other organizations today uh, where you all meet here internally with each other, uh, with other states, and, and I think that's very important. As I've 
as I've gone to these water conferences, um, like I mentioned, I was in Oklahoma last week. Uh, I was in Texas a few weeks before that. Um, Danny Crystal was in Oklahoma City last week, and uh, she spoke on two different panels. Uh, they had invited her to come down and, and talk about specifically how North Dakota was managing water for the future. And, and it was very interesting um, to listen to and, and then to listen to the dialogue uh, at the conference. Uh, North Dakota is doing a lot of things right, and, and other states pay attention, and, and trying to export this, this great collaboration and the great planning that you're all doing here in the state together. Um, within, within these river basins where we operate, uh, that planning, that collaboration, and the communication, it, it can't end at the state borders. And, and we, have to, we have to reach out with, with the same kind of energy, the same kind of uh, proactive approach uh, to our neighbors within the basin so that, so that we're all kind of on the same page. Um, working through disagreements, working through uh, you know, some of the tension that, that naturally exists between the states. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about aging infrastructure and a challenge that that brings. We have population growth uh, putting challenges on our water supply. Uh, we have irrigators who need more water. Uh, and, and then we have these seasons where, where we're not getting as much of the water. Um, or it's coming in a different, it's, it's not coming as much in the form of snow. It's coming as rain. And, and what do we do? How do we store it? What do we do with it uh, to make sure that it's available all year round? Uh, these are some of the challenges uh, facing the entire West. Here in the basin, how do we address that? And we want to be the beneficial partner as, as we do that. Uh, we have money available, like I mentioned. Uh, we are working to make that more available on the ground more efficiently. But what can we do from a, if, if we were to do something from a watershed, a basin-wide watershed approach, uh, what would that look like? So, if I, so I'll go back to the meeting that I had with the Missouri River Roundtable, Missouri River Interagency Roundtable back in February down in Boulder City. What came out of that was an agreement uh, between the Bureau of Reclamation and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, primarily, with support from the other federal agencies. And, and we've met through the year since then. And what, that, what our partnership is focused on is, is working together as federal agencies more effectively to address water resilience in our basins, in this basin in particular. And so our conversations with between Reclamation and the Army Corps, uh, they go something like, how do we change our operations? What flexibilities do we have in our authority that Congress gives us where maybe we can do things a little bit differently? We're, we're trying some of that out right now uh, in Wyoming specifically, where uh, we sat down with the Corps and, and we said, you know, it may help us in some of these tributary basins if we could hold more water back in the reservoir. Uh, and, and that's been a culture shift for the Army Corps and something that we talked with them about when I was in D.C. because they, they're very focused and they, and they have to be focused on, on maintaining a flood pool at these reservoirs in case we get unexpected storms and, and there's a pool to catch that water. But where we've gotten is, is an agreement to do kind of a, a test run, if you will, in Wyoming where they allow us to store more water in that flood pool and we're working with the downstream uh, water users to say, okay, if, if things happen, if we get a big storm, we may have to let more water out than, than you may like, but it's within a band and we're gonna manage with you. We're, we're working on things like that. So that, and, and the purpose of that kind of a test is to say, you know, can we manage these reservoirs in a way where we hold more water so that if we get in a situation where we don't get as much snowpack, we have some left over, we, we're, not, we're not completely clearing that flood pool in the reservoirs and we have that water for beneficial use in the following year. Um, so that's one of the things we're doing with the Corps. Uh, we've also reached out and had some meetings with, with states about you know, maybe, maybe coming up with a forum where the states are more frequently sitting down with each other, the states in the basin, sitting down with each other, talking about what their priorities are, uh, their water projects, um, their resources, the challenges they see on the horizon, and talking together to, to come up with some watershed level solutions. Um, so that's, that's where we're at with that, with that group. And we've met with Andrea. Um, I'm gonna come back to this and, and, and I'm, you're probably getting tired of me saying it, but we want to be beneficial partners. Uh, what we, if, if we can be a facilitator, if we can be um, a tool for you uh, to help you, we wanna do that within our authorized authority, within the authorities that Congress gives us. Uh, but we also feel like it's important for us to be proactive. 
So in the next year, uh, the next two years, you're going to see us um, engaging a little bit more than we have in the past to try to, to try to get those conversations going at a more robust level. I know they're happening right now. Uh, what we want to do is we want to we want to raise the um, profile, if you will, of, of those conversations and really look at, again, what I talked about before. If this basin were to get into a situation like our sister basins, where we have a decade or two decades of drought, what do we do? Because we don't want to get seven years in to a drought situation and only then be come together to figure it out. Uh, we would like to have those plans on the table and we want to work with you to do it. Um, so I think that's about all my time. I'll end there and we have a couple minutes if we want to, if anybody has any questions. Or I'll just end. Thank you for your time. Let's give Marion another round of applause for an interesting talk. To help uh, introduce our next panel, I would like Michael Gunch to come forward. Michael is representing Houston Engineering, our water champion sponsor. And while Michael is coming up, we will play a short message from Houston Engineering. Michael? Houston Engineering's team of civil engineers, planners, surveyors, GIS analysts, and more have served clients for decades. When you work with Houston Engineering, you get a local team supported by a network of professionals who stand in the upper Midwest to provide a whole service experience, from the vision to the completion and everything in between. Let's get to work. Good afternoon. Uh, it's my pleasure today to introduce to you uh, Clay Jenkins and Ken Rice, who are going to enlighten us about the past, present, and future of the Missouri River. Um, Clay Jenkins is a humanities scholar author, social commentator, and has devoted most of his career to public humanities programs. He is one of the nation's leading interpreters of Thomas Jefferson and other historical figures, and has dedicated a better part of his life to researching the historical characters that he portrays. Clay is a recipient of one of the first five Charles Frankel Prizes, the National Endowments for the Humanities, the highest award from President George H. Bush. He serves as editor in charge at large of the uh, governing.com and hosts listening to America radio show and podcast. Clay also leads humanities-based group tours to historic site locales such as the Lewis and Clark Trail in Montana and Idaho, uh, John Steinbeck's California, and Jefferson's France. He lives in Wright in Bismarck, North Dakota. Uh, Ken Rice, many of you know him, obviously, a native of Mandan, North Dakota, graduated Montana State University. He has worked as an engineer for the North Dakota State Highway Department, the North Dakota State Water Commission, the Governor's Office for Old West Regional Commission, North Dakota Public Service Commission. He is a retired professional engineer from Bartlett West. He, Ken has a lifelong history in water involvement in North Dakota. Uh, in recognition of his service, Ken has received the Friends of Rural Water Award from the North Dakota Rural Water Association, the Water Wheel Award from the North Dakota Water Users, and the Commodore Award from the State of North Dakota, and the Upper Missouri River Distinguished Service Award uh, from the Upper Missouri Water Association. Ken is also currently the project manager for uh, the Missouri River Joint Board and their EAE program. With that, I'll hand it over to Tammy Masson, the Executive Director from WAS, who will be moderating the discussion. Good afternoon, thank you all for having us. As he said, I'm the Executive Director for the Western Area Water Supply um, Authority, the project. Um, I'm glad to be here today and I'm glad to be here with these esteemed speakers. Um, I also have the privilege of working closely with Ken on many Missouri River um, issues that we experience today. And then this is my first time getting to meet Clay. They have some really interesting things for you today and then you'll have the opportunity to ask some questions. So if you keep that in mind as they're presenting and um, formulate your questions, we'll have some time to present those. If you'll come on up, Clay, we're happy to hear from you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I hope we can have a spirited discussion here. Uh, I'm delighted to be part of this. I'm a North Dakotan. I was born in Minot, but I grew up in Dickinson. I came back to North Dakota about 20 years ago uh, because I love North Dakota so much. I have a particular um, fascination for the Little Missouri River, uh, but also for the Missouri. But I thought to begin, I should show you the slide. This is North Dakota's only waterfall. <laughs> we have one and only one waterfall, and this is I was there this year. It's about three and a half feet high, and it's near Fort Ransom uh, down in southeastern North Dakota. So I know people come from all over the world to see this. Um, they go to Victoria Falls first, and then they come here. 
second. So I just thought, since this is a water conference, you would certainly want to know that. So today is December 7th, 2023, um, December 7th, 1941, a day that will be remembered in infamy, uh, the sneak attack on Pearl Harbor, and it actually has some implications for the Missouri River Basin. And then on the right is one of my heroes, John Wesley Powell, who was the first white person, at least probably the first person, to float the Colorado River and its canyons in 1869, and he wrote an account of that. But more importantly, he, in a certain sense, became America's first water master. Uh, he was the second director of the U.S. Geological Survey, and he wrote in 1878 an extremely important book called The Arab Lands Report, in which he tried to prevent the problems that have occurred in the west, farther west than North Dakota, and particularly in the Colorado River Basin. And he actually came here uh, to address the North Dakota State Constitutional Convention in the autumn of 1889. He, he gave an impassioned speech and said, here are some problems that you could avoid if you planned the history of water in North Dakota right. And of course, we did not listen to him. Uh, but he, um, if you've never had a chance to read the Arid Lands Report, it's an extraordinary document. The reason that I think that FDR is important is because the Missouri River flooded a number of times in the early 20th century, several times disastrously. And FDR had, in the New Deal, had helped to create the Missouri, um, I'm sorry, the Tennessee Valley Authority. And FDR actually wanted there to be a Missouri Valley Authority uh, along the lines of the TVA. That did not happen. You know, and he was, of course, um, extraordinarily busy with other things by 1943, um, trying to lead America out of the Depression and through the colossal World War. But he was very much um, frustrated by the lack of a plan to tame the Missouri River. And as you all, I'm sure, know, um, Glenn Sloan for the Bureau of Reclamation had developed a plan in, in Billings' office there. And Lewis Pick and the Corps of Engineers had developed a separate plan in Omaha. And they, were, they had some overlap, but in, in many respects, they were quite different plans. And FDR wanted to get this settled, and so he wrote a very stern letter to Congress saying, get this done. And there was, an, a, meeting, there was a meeting in Omaha, October 14th and 15th of 1943, Lewis Pick was elsewhere, but Glenn Sloan was there, and they were, they were told to figure it out, figure out what the flood control plan is going to be for the Missouri. And what they did, historically, is not pick and choose what they were going to create. It was a sort of both end. They, they decided, well, let's do all of it, instead of let's do either the Sloan plan, which was heavy on irrigation, or the Pick plan, which was stronger on navigation and flood control. And so we got a both end development of the river. And if you read some of the literature, and by the way, I have a handout with some of the books that you might find interesting, you probably read them, but if you read uh, accounts of this, it was called a, um, a shameless shotgun wedding, and it overdeveloped, in the minds of some at least, the Missouri River Basin, too many projects, too much damming, and, and certainly too many colossal dams on the river. And so it's been controversial in some part because of that ever since. Um, but we got it. We, that's the plan that we got. And so uh, it's important to realize that if, if there hadn't been a war, FDR might have been able to assert more authority in what happened, and that, that famous Omaha meeting in the autumn of 1943 might not have led to exactly the same results. So first, there's the river itself. Um, it's, a, it's at least the second longest river in North America, depending on how you measure. 2,540 miles from its source at Upper, Upper Red Rock Lake, uh, right on the northern perimeter of Yellowstone National Park. I've been there. It's an extraordinary place. Drains 529,000 square miles. 95 significant tributaries, 15 major dams in Montana and the Dakotas. And Thomas Jefferson, in his, his only book, Notes on the State of Virginia, said, of course, he never came to the West. He never traveled more than 75 miles west of his birthplace. But he said that in his view, from the traveler's reports that he had, the Missouri is actually the main stem, and the upper Mississippi is the tributary. That Missouri beginning, at, say, let's say, three forks for convenience, coming to St. Charles and St. Louis, that's the river. That's the Mississippi. And the upper Mississippi that starts at Lake Itasca is, he believed, uh, just a very significant tributary. You know, I've done a lot of talking at water events around the country, and there are three rivers that are routinely nominated as the most industrialized rivers in America. The Colorado, of course, the Columbia, and the Missouri. And depending on who you read, they'll say, well, the Missouri is the most industrialized river in the country, or the Colorado or the Columbia, but they all are deeply industrialized. And there it is. This is, of course, Montana. One of the, I guess one of the points I would make, I'm not a hydrologist, and I'm not an engineer, and I'm not a water master. And so, so what am I doing here? Uh, but one of the things that I think that's worth thinking about is that we tend to think of the Missouri as a resource rather than as a river. 
It's an American habit, of course, but we tend to think of it as a water resource to be used in all sorts of interesting ways, but not so much as a river. And interestingly, in Montana, it's a little bit different because you can see the landscape. Every year I take a group through the White Cliff section of the Missouri, uh, east of Fort Benton, and you see this sort of extraordinary landscape where it's still something like a river. When you get to Fort Peck, and then Garrison, and Oahe, and down, what you have, of course, is a series of extraordinarily large water impoundments, and it doesn't quite usually behave like a river. And here are the White Cliffs on an absolutely spectacular day uh, east of, of Fort Benton and Great Falls. And there's your basin, of course. And we can thank glaciation for giving us the Missouri River, because as you know, at one time it, it emptied into the Arctic, but it was turned back about 150,000 years ago to form the, uh, you can see essentially the extent of the, of the glaciation to flow in the way that it does. So I would start with Lewis and Clark. I edited the Journal of Lewis and Clark for North Dakota. Um, I'm the editor of the, of the National Lewis and Clark Quarterly called We Proceeded On. I've written a book on, on Meriwether Lewis. Lewis and Clark were here between 1804 and 1806. And, and what's important here, aside from the fact that they spent more time in North Dakota than any other state, is that they regarded the river as a, as a highway. Um, this was an era when rivers were roads and roads were rivers. And the instructions they had from Thomas Jefferson, among others, were to follow the Missouri River to its source or as close to its source as possible, then to climb up over whatever the dividing ridge was, and nobody was quite sure, Jefferson called these the Shining Mountains, and then to find navigable waters of the Columbia system and take it to the sea. And so this was meant to be a, a river road with as few impediments as possible, with the idea that it would become a kind of Northwest Passage, that we would be able to ship furs and other things across the continent by way of this river. It didn't prove to be quite that way. Uh, Lewis later wrote to Jefferson and said, between navigable waters of the Columbia, that is the Snake, um, and navigable waters of the Missouri is 340 miles. And so they had an easy portage, a sort of an automatic switching station in the river that would facilitate American commerce, and particularly commerce to the Far East. That failed in the course of the expedition. This is a, a recent illustration of Lewis and Clark arriving at the Mandan and Hidatsa villages in October of 1804, October 26th. And what's so interesting about it, and here again this, um, is, is um, Carl Bomber's extraordinarily beautiful watercolor of Mitun Tonka, the, one of the five Mandan and Hidatsa villages that Lewis and Clark um, found and wintered at. But this is why they stopped. So we're going to try to drive to Fargo on an exceedingly awful day. And by the way, yesterday it was 62 degrees. Um, sometimes the road is closed. And, and so I've done the math on this. When Lewis and Clark got to what would become Fort Mandan, it was October 26, 1804. Less than a week later, the river closed. The river froze. So they literally could not have gone on at that point, even if they had wanted to. And in the spring, they left Fort Mandan into parts unknown, into what Lewis regarded as terra incognita on April 7, 1805. And that was just five days after the river opened. So think about that. They took the highway as far as they could in 1804, stopped when the road closed, spent five months with the Mandan. The minute the road opened, they took off again. And Lewis wrote a famous journal entry in which he said, we are now about to penetrate a country at least 2,000 miles in width upon which the foot of civilized man has never trodden. So then forward to the steamboat era. The first steamboats on the Missouri came around 1830, 1831, 1832. I've done a lot of research on this, and it's extraordinarily interesting. This, was, this era began when steam found its way into the heart of the country. But the steamboat era ended almost instantaneously when the railroad, when the transcontinentals were completed. It was a, it was a time-bound technology and transport system. And the minute there was a, a, an alternative, and indeed a much safer al alternative, the steamboat traffic dwindled and, and, and disappeared. It's a little bit like VHS and beta. You know, the, the minute there's a better technology, the old one uh, tends to disappear very quickly. And we now know that of all the steamboats that came up the Missouri, if you can imagine, it's an astonishing statistic, one in four sank or burned. So one out of every four steamboats during that extraordinary era, that romantic era, sank or burned. You know, you, I wouldn't go on a Southwest airline with those statistics. Um, but, of course, it's a little easier to swim than it is to fall out of the, a plane at 38,000 feet. And there are lots of steamboats that are either in the river, and several have been excavated. Um, the Bertrand, is, there's an extraordinary uh, museum and exhibit for the Bertrand uh, near Omaha, and another even better one at Kansas City. And as you know, during the, the low water years a couple of years ago, one in North Dakota was, uh, was seen between Bismarck and Wilton, and, and is there, and could, be, and could be excavated under the right conditions. So this is something I discovered in researching my book, uh, the Language of Cottonwoods, Essays on the Future of North Dakota, which I invite you to take a look at sometime. A steamboat plying the Missouri River from its mouth to Fort Benton consumed approximately 6,000 trees. 
per year. 6,000. And Captain Sire here said, unless one takes measures to replenish in advance, I would not be surprised if in a couple of years there are no cottonwoods left. In other words, they were extracting the cottonwoods from the Missouri Basin to fuel the steamboats that were heading upriver. And they were burning it at such a rate that there was a serious consideration that they would simply run out of the resource and they would have to end, end the steamboat traffic because of that. So from a certain point of view, the cottonwoods were saved by the collapse of the steamboat industry because they had no alternative fuel at that time. Now today, as you know, the future of trees along the Missouri River is a huge and difficult issue, but it's not related to their being cut up and used for fuel. It's related to the ways in which the river has been domesticated to the point that it can't refresh uh, with silt uh, the low spots along the river from which cottonwoods can grow and thrive. And there you see a spectacular stand of cottonwoods as two in Montana. All right, so that's the second phase of, of, the, of the historical remarks I wish to make. Now the more difficult one. And let me tell you a story about this. Um, as, as I'm sure you know, generally speaking, Garrison Dam was a horrific impact on the Mandan, Hidatsa, and Arikara. Uh, they were farmers. Their farms were down in the river itself, right along the river, and the river would flood a little every year. They would wait until it dried enough to plant corn and other um, plants, uh, and then they would see it through to the fall. And so they were, at the time that the Garrison Dam was, was created, the Mandan, Hidatsa, and Arikara were, were certainly not prospering, but they were doing pretty well. But the dam took 155,000 acres in the heart of the reservation, the best farmland they had, in some respects, the best farmland in North Dakota at the time. And fully 85% of all the Mandan, Hidatsa, and Arikara people were forced by the U.S. government and, and, and for their own safety to leave the bottomlands and relocate up on the bluffs, and including in the new utopian village that was being built for them at Newtown. It's an extraordinary story, and, and, and here's the, this little anecdote I want to give you. So a friend of mine named Joey King came uh, three years ago, and he said to me, I want to see, I want to tour Garrison Dam. So I hadn't done this in you know, maybe 20 years. We went up there, and we were um, two of a group of about 20 on this tour. And when we got there, I just finished my book, which has a chapter on, on this subject. I said, let's listen to the guide, to the docent, and see if she mentions the impact of Garrison Dam on Native Americans. And so it was about an hour's tour. And this young woman, she was a student at the University of Mary. She was extremely bright, well-prepared, uh, articulate, and helpful. She uh, gave the tour and, and, and at no point mentioned Native Americans, not once. And then there were questions, and she answered all the questions, uh, you know, how many fence stocks and how much power is developed, and you know, et cetera. So at the end, because I just wanted to see, I just sort of instantly raised my hand uh, as just a complete stranger and said, uh, could you, do you is there any, do you have any sense of, of the impact of, of, of this project on, on the Indians, on the Native Americans? And she looked at me sort of blankly, and she and paused for two or three seconds, and then she said, well, I don't know a lot about that, but I know they were very well compensated, which of course is simply not true. How can it be? How can it be that this extraordinary project, Garrison Dam, from which we have benefited, can be talked about in the 21st century? without a single mention of the people whose lives were fundamentally disrupted and in some places destroyed by this project. You would think that the core, and maybe other docents do, you would hope that the, the core of the Bureau of Reclamation would say that of course there has to be Congress, of course there has to be a mention of the impact of this. So Pixel Plan cited Garrison Dam, where it is. You probably know this, but here's um, that's that Lewis Pick on the right and Glenn Sloan on the left making the dam. The Mandan, the Hidatsa, and the Arikara were never consulted. This happened without them in any sense being at the table. This was a project that was done at the high water market of America's industrial power. It was planned without their consultation. It was cited without their consultation. And then, of course, there were some meetings on the reservation to tell the natives what was about to happen and to convince them that they would, in some sense, benefit from this. And there was a meeting in which Lewis Pick uh, was presenting the plan, and this uh, native person came up and confronted him and, and reports very, but maybe, maybe did a rude gesture of some sort. Lewis Pick flew into a rage and stalked out of the meeting and said that he would make sure that the Mandan were punished for standing up for their lifeway against what amounts to an industrial holocaust. This is what the Amazing Nation said in a formal letter to 
Washington, we recognize the value to our white neighbors and to the people downstream of the plan to control the river and to make use of the great surplus floodwaters, but we cannot agree that we should be destroyed, drowned out, removed, and divided for the public benefit while all other white communities are protected and safeguarded by the same river development plan, which now threatens us with destruction. What doesn't get any plainer than that? So there is a map of the reservation, much wrong from its borders in, in 1851, but that's the reservation that existed at the time. And what the dam did was not only flood out 85% of the residents of this sovereign nation, but it flooded nine towns. It simply inundated nine towns, and Hook and Independence and so on, Sonish, gone and gone forever. And during the really droughty years, you can go up and see, and, and sometimes even now at Van Hook, you can see just a little of what was once a Native American community with a layout of streets and the basements and so on. But in addition to that, you can see, maybe I can make this work, the, the, dam, the, the lake divides the people so that because there was no bridge, the bridge was removed to make the dam near Halde on North Dakota 8. And so to get to the western or southern segments of the reservation, you had to drive all the way around. There was no easy way for, for people who had known each other for all their lives and, and, and family groups that had known each other for centuries to get together because, of course, automobiles were something that were not routinely available to the Native Americans at that time. So it not only you know, flooded out their homelands and their farmlands and their sacred sites and their cemeteries, but it also created this fragmentation that continues to this day. So, uh, this is at the new extraordinary MHA Interpretive Center up in Newtown. If you haven't been there, I so strongly urge you to go. Uh, it's amazing in all sorts of ways. And this is a wall that, sorry, uh, I better leave it. Um, anyway, there's a wall there. It's a little bit like the Vietnam Memorial in Washington, D.C. that names every family from every one of the villages that was forcefully relocated. So, just to look at this, the tribe was not consulted. The best 155,000 acres were inundated. 85% of the families were relocated. Cemeteries and cemeteries. Nine villages. When Lewis Pick was confronted, instead of understanding why that rage might be rational, or certainly understandable, uh, he decided to punish the MHA. Uh, MHA said, look, we have other lands. We'll swap that site for another one. We'll give you those lands. We'll cooperate. We'll be happy. We, we, we believe the Missouri River needs to be domesticated. We just don't want it to be right here, um, they were completely ignored. Um, and then finally, Williston discovered that with the dam at the, at the height that it was going to be in extreme wet years, there might be some possibility of flooding in the eastern parts of Williston. They made this known to the Corps of Engineers and the dam was lowered 20 feet to accommodate the white citizens of Williston. But there was no effort of any sort to accommodate the concerns of the Native Americans. Well, you can say that, that was then and this is how these things happen, so on and so forth. But you know that the, the garrison dam could not be built today without Native Americans at the table. That it was possible then, because we had a much different attitude toward Native American sovereignty and so on. But we all know that this couldn't happen today unless the peoples most affected by it were brought to the table. And they simply weren't. So what should we do about that? I mean, we're not going to breach the dam. There have been some major compensation packages partly put together by the former U.S. Senator Kent Conrad. There's no turning back. But it seems to me that we should insist that we never talk about this dam without also making sure we talk about its impact on the Native Americans whose sovereign nation homeland uh, it most affected in South Dakota. Well, he inundated 220,000 acres for, in Lakota lands, but it's a little different there because the Lakota were not farmers. They were hunters. And so even though the, the bottom lands mattered to them, they didn't matter in the way that they did to uh, the MHA. And there's a, a period Bosart of the engineering the amazing uh, achievement of it. And this is one of the villages where the water now is beginning to climb up and will eventually in a year or two completely inundate that village. And this, of course, is a famous photograph. And up at the MHA um, Tribal Council building, there's a giant print of this on the wall. So that when you go in, you see this image. This is Tribal Chairman George Gillette at the Compensation Package Agreement hearing uh, signing ceremony in Washington, D.C. And he tried very hard to maintain his composure, we couldn't. And he said, you realize this effectively destroys uh, the Mandan people. A great book on this subject, which I encourage you to read, and, and Ken and I were talking about just a short time ago, by Paul Vander Elder, Coyote Warrior, is about all of this and its impact. All right, so I'll just I'll close my remarks by just saying a word about trans space and diversions. And you know, I, I sort of hesitate here because this is sort of a done deal, but one of the things that John Wesley Powell uh, insisted upon was the trans basin diversions, that is the removal of water from one hydrological basin over the divide and into another one, is inherently problematic. And of course, he, when he said those things, he did not know of the environmental 
um, difficulties that could be raised, you know, biota getting from one system into another. He saw it more in terms of distributive justice, but this was his view. Number one, in any translation diversion, there are winners and losers. And if you need proof of that, you just need to, to study the Los Angeles Aqueduct and the um, capture of the waters of Owens Lake on the eastern um, flank of the Sierras in California's first, in LA's first great water gap. Um, the, the film Chinatown somewhat inaccurately depicts part of that. Number two, and this is something Paul didn't really understand, but there are inevitable environmental issues, some of them representing the law of unintended consequences. So for example, uh, biota, we, we talked about some of the, 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 the muscles this morning that can get from one system into another, but a whole range of biota can pass, and when they do, they become really, in some cases, toxic invasive species. And of course, we develop the best sort of screens that we possibly can and so on, but we, we all know, just from the lecture that we heard this morning, that there is no 100% screen against the passage of biota from one hydrological system to another, often with difficult or even catastrophic results. But another environmental problem, well, two more, one is that when Owens Valley was uh, robbed of its water for Los Angeles, it uh, left behind uh, an ancient inland sea uh, which, under which there are extraordinarily toxic chemicals. And now those toxic chemicals were exposed as they are currently now being exposed in Great Salt Lake as it diminishes. And those toxic chemicals create respiratory problems and pollution and so on. This is something that LA didn't necessarily understand when it came to Owens Valley and frankly didn't much care. And then third, and then the other one is of course that we all know the Colorado River almost never reaches its mouth. Its waters are fully subscribed before it reaches its mouth with, with serious environmental impacts on the kinds of um, biota, plants and animals and, and birds and so on that live in the, in the mouth of any, in the delta of any great river system. This is Owens River, right at the heart of Sierra. I was there last year, I climbed Mount Whitney, or rather I dragged myself up Mount Whitney. Um, and here's the aqueduct, and this is a great historic photograph. You see the water actually coming down. This is when they turned on the tap, and the water from the eastern slope of the Sierra found its way into the canal system that then fed, not LA, but the San Fernando Valley, which is the basis of the film Chinatown. And LA was not done yet. They went after Mono Lake. I don't know if you've been to Mono Lake. It's one of the most beautiful places on earth, I think. And they were draining it. But there's a Mono Lake Association, uh, which struck back legally. And LA came to the table, and some, some extraordinary compromises have been made. Um, and so Mono Lake is not what it once was, but it's no longer in any, any immediate danger. Um, it, it, to have destroyed Mono Lake would have been one of the great environmental and aesthetic uh, cataclysms that come from industrialization. And here's, here's the stuff that comes off the lake bed in Owens Lake, uh, the, the toxic arsenic and other chemicals in, in, that, in that dust that has been revealed. So that doesn't mean we shouldn't send water to Fargo, and it's happening, of course. But I raise this because, first of all, John Wesley Powell was the wisest person per water of the 19th century, and he told us, think about this, think about this, think about this, think about this. And we should, I think, it would, knowing what we know about the laws of unintended, con unintended consequences, I think it's fair to say that we cannot finally know what will happen when the waters of the Missouri routinely mingle with the waters of the Cheyenne and the Red. And Manitoba, as you know, has been a, a perennial critic of garrison diversion, in, in part for that reason. But I think if anyone in this room said, I can guarantee that there will never be an, an unseen environmental consequence of this transfer, I think I would say you need to read more history. That doesn't mean we shouldn't do it, but we should do it with our eyes open and fully understanding. And, and the last thing I would say about that, and this is, I suppose, the most controversial thing I have to say, and I don't mean to be controversial. I just uh, want to raise these issues for our consideration, at least, and further reading, because I haven't done justice to them. But, you know, Fargo has a water problem. Um, the river floods because it's flowing north into the Arctic, um, and there are periods of drought. The last, the last time there wasn't enough water in the red was during the Dust Bowl era, but it's chronically water short. When it gets the water, as it will, there will be essentially no limit to growth in Fargo. So Fargo now has a population of about 120,000 people. Um, people think in 10 years or 15, it might be 200 or 250,000 people. But once we supply that water, there is no disincentive of any sort to step and say, well, how big should maybe Fargo be? Because if you, if you, if you privilege Fargo with this resource, that means that Fargo is going to continue to become this North Dakota's metropolis is going to drain the state, not just hydrologically, but culturally and politically, too. I'm not saying it shouldn't happen, but one of the results will be that Fargo will be able to plan essentially unlimited growth in the heart of one of the most fertile uh, agricultural zones in the world. And it seems to me that 
we should at least have a conversation about why, why wouldn't it be possible maybe to live within one's means? Does Fargo need unlimited water source? Are there, are there other solutions, in-basin solutions, which is what John Wesley Powell would urge? Did Phoenix really need its exponential growth of the past 40 years, or, or would it have been better if Phoenix had had to live within its own hydrological region? I don't have any answer to that, and that doesn't really appeal to the American ethos of growth and progress and, and profit. But it seems to be worth considering, because I'll just close with this. Like it or not, water is in some respects a zero-sum game. There are winners and losers. And in this case, as in many other cases of this sort, government chooses winners and losers. And, losers. and when government get in, engaged in this to choose winners and losers, that raises a, a very large number of questions about how democracy works. So I, I guess my point is, the Missouri is not an infinite resource. I don't think we're going to have sea droughts of the sort that occurred in the Southwest because our population is very small in the Missouri Basin, and the Missouri runs five times the flow of the Colorado. But there will be periods of, of less flow, of course. And it seems to me that we should, you know, we just heard, don't plan for the worst, plan for the worster. I wouldn't necessarily say that of this basin, but it seems to me we should plan for a, a time of scarcity. And when you, when you build scarcity into the equation, when it's on the whiteboard with everything else, uh, that changes the conversation. So, thank you. Thank you for your comments and your presentation, Clay. Now we're going to have Ken with some information on the Missouri River as it is today. Well, I'm not sure how to work the slideshow. Let me figure it out here. Green one. Green one. Well, uh, thanks, Clay. That's a good, uh, lot of good information. I should tell you, the book that you referenced, uh, Coyote Warrior, uh, some of you folks may remember the author of that book was a uh, guest speaker at our water convention here, probably back when Dale Frank was state engineer. So what would that be, 15 years ago? He came and talked at the convention and talked about that book. So it was quite interesting. So uh, Clay talked about the Missouri River of the past, and my job is to talk about the Missouri River of the present. Um, and so I'm going to focus on three things. I'm going to focus on... Uh, the ongoing EAE program, and you, you know, if you're a water person, you've heard about this already, but I want to talk about it one more time because it is what we're doing in the present. EAE is educate, advocate, and engage. I want to talk about this. My, my glass won't let me read that. I want to talk about how we use the water in the state of North Dakota. I mean, where's it permitted to, and who's using the water? Mostly in the West, the irrigators use the water. That's not true in North Dakota. They're not the biggest user of water. And lastly, because I'm talking about the present, I want to talk about what the Corps of Engineering plans do with the river system in the year 2024. Uh, every year they have a plan, and I'll tell you what their plan is for 2024. Again, I, I am engaged with the uh, Missouri River Joint Water Board, and that's a water board that uh, is comprised of counties up and down the river. If your county touches the river or the lake, uh, you can be a member of the board. Now, that's the way the rules are now. Uh, you know, most of you water folks know that the Senate Bill 2372 that just got passed that uh, requires all counties to be part of a joint water board. So now... You don't have to touch the river to be part of the Missouri River Joint Water Board. You just have to be within the basin. And that's darn near half the state of North Dakota. And so if you're a county that's within the Missouri River Basin, uh, you may want to think about what your legal requirement is in terms of joining a joint water board. I won't pitch it any more than that. Um, this program, the EAE program, I want to acknowledge our funders because it's a program that's funded in part by Garrison Diversion, um, in part by the state of North Dakota. You know, they have a robust program for funding these type of efforts, and in part by the local people. Uh, the local water boards. Uh, it's generally a pretty even split, you know, one third, one third, one third in that neighborhood. Uh, and also the Southwest Water Authority uh, contributes um, a significant amount of money to keep the program going. Now, we've only been going a year and a half, and so we don't have a long history, but we intend to move forward in 2024 with that kind of same funding program. This card here, you'll notice it's August of 22, and you might say, well, why are you putting up a card that said August of 22? Well, last year in, 19, in, 19, in 2022, we uh, put on a, what we call a stakeholders meeting in Mandan, North Dakota. We invited water leaders from over the state to come to Mandan and tell us what they thought of the Missouri River, what they thought the strength of the river was, and the weakness, and the opportunities, and the threats. And we wanted to hear from people on the ground, water managers and water policy makers, and just the general public, and regulatory people. And um, I know these tables get a little hard to read, but I think it's important to note that that's a pie chart of who showed up. And you can see the different colors. Mostly it was water managers, people who serve on rural water boards and water, water districts. But we had a good selection, a good uh, cross-section of water policy makers, people from the state, and that includes state legislators, county commissioners, city council people, uh, those type of folks. And then we had regulatory people. The Corps of Engineers was there, the USGS, of course, the Reclamation. So we had a good cross-section to talk about these issues, the strengths, the weaknesses, the opportunities, and the threats of the river. Um, that was one effort we, we did, and, and uh, we've issued a report on it. By the way, if any of you would like to see a report where we talk about those issues, you know, what are they? We'll be happy to give you the report. 
The other thing we do on the EAE program, I'm going to keep my presentation short. I'm going to skip through a lot of this. Is we come up with a every month we every month we put an article in the Water Magazine uh, about Missouri River issues. This is one of the first articles we put in, written by our chairman Ray Bachmeyer. Uh, it says our Missouri River is, uh, is an audit of promises made. Now they talked about the Pick Sloan Act. The Pick Sloan Act made promises to the state of North Dakota, and uh, you know the federal government doesn't give you anything for free. We had to give the government something for those promises, but we expected something in return. And so that article, you can find that article on our website. You know, it tells what we had to give. You know, what the promise is. And we know what we gave, right? We give 150,000 acres of land. All the upper basin states gave land. That's nothing new there. Montana gave land. North Dakota gave land. South Dakota gave land. Lower basin states didn't give anything in terms of land. Um, 13,000 acres from the state of Nebraska. That's what they gave. Kansas gave zero. Missouri gave zero. Iowa gave zero. They had no land inundated. But North Dakota, South Dakota, Montana gave up land to build the dams. That's what we gave. And Clay did a nice job telling about what the Indian tribes gave, especially the Mandan Hadassah Rikara. They were the most impacted people, as he adequately, very successfully showed you. But that's an honor of the promises made and what, what we were expecting to get and what did we get. I talked about, the, in the article I did, I talked about the history of Pick Sloan and, you know, Pick and Sloan, they were dead enemies. They didn't like each other. Uh, one was the bureau guy, one was the core guy, one was the bureaucrat, one was more down to earth. You can guess which was which, I'm sure. Um, but uh, they didn't like each other. They, didn't, they had competing plans and Congress forced them into a shotgun marriage, as Clay mentioned. So we talk about the history of Pick Sloan in North Dakota. That's one of the articles. Uh, we did an article called The Flood That Never Ended, and that's a story about how it impacted the tribes, particularly Mandan, Hadassah, Rikara. That's one of the articles. And uh, of all the articles we put in the magazine, this one got the most response. And we got calls on this article from a number of people around the state saying they, they like that article. You know, people in North Dakota like history. They like the history of that article. It talked about the impact. It talked about the testimony given by the chairman of the tribe, Chairman George Gillette at the time. He was, by the way, he was the grandfather of Tex Hall. Some of you remember Tex Hall was chairman for a while, but George Gillette was Tex Hall's grandfather. George Gillette in D.C. gave testimony to... Uh, Senate committee on this, and it, it talks about that, his testimony. And he begrudgingly acknowledged that, you know, you didn't have much choice there, they're going to have to accept that, those waters on their land. So that article's in there. Um, Mike Gunch, who introduced us, presented an article about the value of recreation in North Dakota. You know, recreation uh, creates $80 million a year in revenue for the state of North Dakota. $80 million, that's not too bad. When they first wrote the Pick Sloan Act, the Corps and the Bureau did not envision that recreation would generate a lot of money. That was not a big deal for them, generating funds or revenue for the state of North Dakota. As it turns out, $80 million. Dollars. Now, 80 million is not compared to what the Colorado River does. That's times 10, right? The Colorado River, they have white rafting on there and fishing and boating, but what 80 million for North Dakota is pretty good. And then we did an article on, and this is Clay Careful from State Point article, and nobody's called it Altered River. We had an article that preceded this called about siltation. For many years, the Missouri River Drain Water Board only focused on sedimentation issues, you know, and erosion. And that's all we focused on. We weren't worried about downstream states taking our water, and we weren't, we weren't particularly worried about the Corps of Engineers coming in and imposing user fees on our water, which they have, of course, since 2005. They've tried to impose that rule. Charge us for taking water out of the river. Uh, Holden, and I should say Senator Holden, uh, put a stop to that. It's a temporary stop. We weren't worried about those issues. We were worried about sedimentation and erosion, and so we had an article on that, and then we followed Clay, put an article in following it that was state concern. So, if, and we, read, we write an article every month. Those are just a selection of three or four of them. So if you're interested in Missouri River issues, watch the North Dakota Water Magazine. Uh, this month, the, the article in there is talked about the value of the river to North Dakota, economic value. In December, I'm going to say this month, I mean the November issue. In December, the article is going to be talking about the Corps' plan to run the river, and I'm going to talk about that anyway here in a minute. In January, we're going to do an article on our good friend Herb Grants. I don't know if Herb's in the audience, but Herb is a landowner down in Emmons County. He runs JT Ranch. And the Wahi Dam was built. They flooded 2,000 acres of his ranch. Uh, he was about six or seven years old when that happened. They came to his house, and they talked to his dad, and his dad said, well, we know you're going to take the land, you know, that's nothing new about that. We know we're going to be compensated. By the way, they paid them $60 an acre for the land. They were paying the Indians $40 an acre, and they were paying people close to Bismarck $100 an acre. It was a quarter of engineers of prayer. But $60 an acre in 1940, I guess, you know, that's, that's what it was. But Herb remembers his dad saying, well, once you take the land, can we get access for our cattle to the river? Can we put our pipeline across that land to draw for irrigation? And what do you think the Corps said? The Corps said, well, we don't know. Sign the papers, take the check, and we'll figure that out later. Well, when later came, it turned out, but no, the access was not such an easy deal. You had to pay to cross that land. Uh, and I don't think it reminds me telling you that his family has to pay $3,000 a year just to cross that land so his cattle can now have water. Now, of course, they don't have to buy that access, but if you don't, then you have to put up a fence. And you have to maintain that fence. I think her probably had two or three or four miles of fencing he had put up. Well, that's not practical. I'm getting off on a tangent here, but I'm, that, that was one of the things that we talked about in one of the, uh, one of the issues we talked about. Um, Later in the year, we did some public meetings. We had a meeting in Linton, North Dakota, and, we might, and we're going to be doing these uh, more public meetings this next year. So if you're interested in a public meeting in your county or your area, uh, just let us know. Now, we did a meeting in Linton, North Dakota. Uh, Glenn Giffrey, the Emmons County Board, have posted. 
Uh, and what do you think of Egypt? Was the issue down there was, why can't we ever get out of the river? Why can't we ever get out of the river? Well, number one, it's hard to get access. I just told you the Herb Brent story. Uh, number two, uh, cost of power is high. Pitt's phone promised low-cost power for irrigation. Uh, that didn't happen. Um, cost of power is high, um, and the access issue is a problem. We did a meeting in Fargo, a public meeting, uh, talking about the importance of the river to what we call our East Coast, right, Fargo people. What do you think the issue there was? The issue was Red River Valley Water Supply Program. And Dwayne Decray was with us on that, and Dwayne had to carry the weight of that meeting because everybody wanted to talk to Dwayne about Red River, and he carried it. Uh, Senator Sorblog uh, did the introduction, and the joint board, uh, Keith Wesson, uh, moderated uh, on the joint, the Red River Joint Board cooperated on that meeting. And then later we went to Devil's Lake. Uh, Jeff Ritt and his Devil's Lake board helped us put that together. Representative Johnson was moderator. And the issue there was ANS, uh, co-op nuisance. So depending where you go to state, people have a different interest. Let me tell you what, why uh, we're at in North Dakota, what we contributed. Now, Clay had a slide that talked about um, um, the land that we contributed, and I made a comment about it earlier. Um, 100, overall, you know, in that 580, 600,000 acres, most of it, or all of it, Montana, North Dakota, South Dakota. Um, I, I say that because I want, I want to impress upon people what the Upper Basin State put into the program, what we did out of the program, or the program being picked alone, what the benefits are. And I've got an entire different presentation on this. We could talk at length about what the benefits are. Uh, let me give you an example. South Dakota puts in 60% of power. They were promised they could have, you know, in some neighborhood of 20%. And when I say promise, that would be 20% of low-cost power. I'm talking about South Dakota, but I could use North Dakota. North Dakota puts in about 16% because they only have the one dam garrison. But the point is the same. We have North Dakota, South Dakota, Montana, these are the dam that generate electricity. Uh, they get some fraction of that. And it's not preference power. It's market rate power for the most part. And so that's one promise that was made, uh, considering what we put in. We also contribute water. Um, now, we're a dry state, right? We're, you know, we're the next thing to a desert in western North Dakota, so we don't have a lot of winter rain runoff. But there is, a, there is about six to 7,000 CFS we put in the river. By the time the river leaves North Dakota, it's flowing in about 20,000. So we're putting in about six. The rest comes from Montana, right? So Montana's putting in about 13, 14. We put in six, right? It leaves North Dakota about 20,000 CFS. And that's, that's pretty close to the same it did in the 30s in the drought. That's why you always say we're about proof river. That's not entirely true, but that's what leads us to believe that. It, was, it dropped down maybe to 15,000 15, DFS. By the time it gets to the mouth of St. Louis, it's 60,000. So we're putting in 6,000, 7,000. It leaves into the Mississippi at 60,000. We put in about, you know, let's call it 10%. Um, now, let's, let's keep that number in mind. Um, does that mean we get 10% of the river? Is that what we should be using? Is that all right? Um, that opens up another can of worms. If, you, if you're a student of the Colorado River system, you'll know that just because you put water in a river doesn't mean you get to use it. I mean, Wyoming contributes most of the water to the Colorado River system, but who uses all the water? California. California doesn't put much water in the Colorado River system, but they use most of the water. So it's not what you put in the system, so that's, a, that's an argument we have to be careful making. It's, I think it depends on who's got the political clock to take the water out. It comes down to. Most of you have seen this map before. Your map in the upper left corner, it shows you the relative impact of the Missouri River in North Dakota in terms of uh, total flow. And you can see the Missouri River just totally dominates the map. Uh, the total flow in North Dakota is in the Missouri River. I don't recall this, the number, but it's certainly got to be in the 90, 95 percent. And the next, the river's next to it, the next biggest river uh, is a Yellowstone. And the Yellowstone's only in North Dakota for, what is it, four or five miles, right? And it becomes part of Missouri. And after that, you've got the rivers like the Hart, the Jane, the Cheyenne. But the Missouri River is a dominating river in North Dakota. And um, we've talked about, I think uh, Clay had it on his slide, the length of the river. I think his slide said the second my slide, maybe the first, I guess, depends how you measure it. The six main stem dams. Uh, people, don't, when we talk about the Missouri River system, people always recognize the Wahi Dam. Fort Peck, by the way, was built before the 44 Flood Control Act. It's part of the, uh, the 44 Flood Control Act. It's got grandfather idea. You think about, you know, Fort Peck, Garrison, Wahi, Gavin Point, um, Fort Randall. You don't recognize that the, the program actually included many, many dams beside this main stem dam. It's just an all encompassing program. So that's a uh, flow through uh, the states, it flows through two Canadian provinces. It drains one fourth of all the egg producing land in the United States. So that's quite a drainage area, one fourth of all egg producing lands. It uh, had seven authorized purposes, and they're listed there. They all know in my heart because we've talked about it at length water supply, uh, flood control, uh, navigation, power, recreation, irrigation. It's interesting to note that the act is called the 1944 Flood Control Act. It's not called the 1944 Water Supply Act. You know, it's not called the 1944 Recreations Act. I mean, the title tells you what the importance was, was on flood control. And, um, and that's, that shows you the dominance of Corps of Engineers, because the Corps deals with flood control. Um, they were started by Thomas Jefferson. They go back to Thomas Jefferson. He started them for navigation, but in the early 1900s, they got a mandate from Congress to be a flood control agency. And that's why the act is called the Flood Control Act, even though it's a combined act of the Bureau of Reclamation. And the Bureau, the Bureau was started to repopulate or populate the West. You know, they're not interested in flood control necessarily, they're interested in water supply, consumption of the water. So if there's too much water, the core is involved. If there's too little water, the bureau is involved, right? The bureau dams the, puts dams on the river because there may be too little water, 
the Corps puts dams on the river because there may be too much water. <laughs> They're just in conflict with their basic principles. And that goes back to the conflict of Peg Sloan. Now, I've got some slides I borrowed from John Pakowski last year, or maybe it was two years ago. John, our state engineer, put together a program. Some of you may say this is plagiarism. I call it collaboration, John. So I've used your slides. Uh, where does the water go in North Dakota? I mean, and I'm talking about Missouri River water. Who takes Missouri River water? Uh, well, these are their permits. So as of two years ago, now it's probably pretty close, there were about 248 permits. And of course, to take water out of the river, uh, you need a permit from the state of North Dakota. North Dakota still has a right, thank God, to issue permits. The federal government has not taken that right over. Um, now, you, if you live next to the river, you can take a mineral out without a permit, but we're not counting those. We're talking about people who have to have permits. Uh, who gets the permits? Well, most of the permits are held by irrigators. So you can see that dark blue? Uh, what does it say? 166 of the 248 is irrigation permits. That doesn't mean they use the water. That just means they have the permits. They hold the number of permits. They've got the record. And everything else is divided between whatever rural water and recreation and power generation and those type of things. But irrigators are the ones who hold most of the permits out of the state out of the Missouri River. And that includes even fracking companies. They haven't made a big impact. But what about consuming the water? Just because the irrigators hold the permits, does that mean they consume the water? No, it doesn't. Uh, you remember, irrigators use most permits, but the very light shade of blue on this pie chart is irrigation use of water. So that's a, that's a complete opposite of what's being done in the rest of the western United States, where irrigators not only hold all the permits, or not all the permits, but a majority of the permits, but in western United States, they use the majority of the water. Uh, even in the populated states of Arizona and, and, and so forth, irrigators are the ones who use western water. So it's a little different in North Dakota. And why is that? Well, I'll tell you one reason. Because when Pix Loan was passed, they told us, give us those lands, and we'll give you a 1.2 million acre irrigation project with low cost power. Well, we did get a 1.2 million irrigation project out of this deal. Right now, we're at 70,000 acres. That's what's authorized. That's not what's built. Right now, the thing's been whittled down to 70,000 acres from 1.2 million. So there's a promise made and a promise broken. Uh, and with power, there's a promise made and a promise broken. Uh, who else uses the water? Well, most of the water is used by the, I guess you'd call it an orange colored shade, that's municipal. And that makes sense. Every, every major city, and you can go through Montana all the way to St. Louis, if you're on the Missouri River, you use the Missouri River for drinking water. It's an easy source of water to treat, and it's dependable. Now, you know, I, I use the phrase drought proof. Not quite drought proof, we don't know, but darn near drought proof. It's enough where you'd invest in the million dollars to put infrastructure with a belief that it's going to be there when you need it. And you can see the other users of the water, but that's a consumptive use of water. It's consuming water. The biggest permit holder in the state of North Dakota is the state of North Dakota. You see that tall blue line there? There's a, almost a 1.8 million acre feet of water is held by the state of North Dakota, permitted out of the system. Uh, now, you might say, do they just permit the water to themselves? Well, whatever. They hold the biggest permit. And next to them is the Bureau of Reclamation. And the Bureau of Reclamation has a permit to encourage irrigation projects, of course. And then you see the other big users of water. The biggest in North Dakota. Uh, our Northwest Area Water Supply and Garrison Diversion. Now look at Garrison Diversion. There's an example of a system that's actually going to use, cons in consumptive terms, is going to eventually use that 120,000 acres. And I want to make a comment about the 120,000 acres. Um, that may seem like a lot of water, a and it is a lot of water, right? 120,000 acre feet. But let's remember, the system from Montana down to St. Louis, on any given year, flushes through, you know, takes snow melt and rainfall, flushes through the system about 25 million acre feet, 26, some number like that. So Garrison, in North Dakota, if you have all those together, they run around 3.5 or 3.9. We're taking, we're taking a good percentage, but we're not using it consumptively. But the system transports about 25, 26 million acre feet through the system. And most of that water is not used by anybody. It goes to the Gulf of Mexico. It's un unpermitted. Even the downstream states, the big states of Missouri that have population in Kansas, they don't, they don't touch it. I and mean, they don't touch all the water in the river. They don't have enough demand down there either. They may challenge us when we try to use it, but they themselves can't use it either. Uh, one issue that comes up is the number of permits. Look at this graph here. You see the tallest line here is back in the 1960 era. That's when most of the permits to the river were issued. Now, what happened in 1960 to all of a sudden you have kind of a, a rush to get a water permit out of the Missouri River? I don't know, but if I see John Pakowski, I'm going to ask him that question. I suspect there might have been a regulatory change. Maybe that's what happened. Maybe the State Water Commission said, hey, you guys, start permitting that water. We can't just have you take I don't know. But for some reason, we started seeing spikes in 1960 where people rushed to the Water Commission and actually put on paper that they wanted permits. And it's a good thing they did. You know, they used to say, it's better to be upstream with a shovel than downstream with a permit. You've all heard that saying? Well, that's not true. Uh, it's better to have a permit. You have the permit, that's your water. And whether North Dakota issues it to you or South Dakota or Nebraska, a permit establishes your water right. And uh, you have to have senior water right. And if you don't get your permit in time, then you're junior to other rights. So you can see what's happened over the years. And then the last 30 years, 20 years, that's tapered off. The number of permits being issued, even with fracking, has tapered off. They're not issuing a lot of permits on a relative sense. Who's the big winners and who's the big losers? You know, 
There's a book written by a guy named Thornton, and I think his name is John Thornton. I bet you would know him, Clay. He's from Montana. John Thornton wrote a book called uh, River of Promise, River of Peril, and he talks about who's the big winner on fixed loan. Well, you know who I think the big winner is and the big loser? And he says the biggest winner was Nebraska. Nebraska didn't give up any land. They got a low lift out of the river for irrigation, uh, and they had bigger, they had bigger irrigation projects. And they, they got good domestic demand, you know, Omaha, Council Bluffs, Lincoln. Um, they've got a good population that uses that water. They're the biggest winner on the Fixed Loan Act. And Minnesota, which Minnesota is not really a Missouri River state, although it does, you know, there's a little bit of drainage in Minnesota. We don't we usually think about Minnesota as being a Missouri River basin state, but they kind of are. They've got a little corner down there. They're a winner. Why is Minnesota a winner? They take all our power. Iowa takes our power, and they, of course, have water, uh, irrigation, and Missouri and Kansas. They're the winners. Who's the losers? Colorado got nothing out of the deal. Wyoming, they got nothing out of the deal. They didn't give up much, but they didn't get anything either. And, of course, the biggest losers, Montana, North Dakota, South Dakota, gave up the land, received a bunch of promises, and did not receive what they were promised. So now let me go to the last part of my presentation. Uh, every year the Corps of Engineers, uh, the Corps, by the way, has the congressional authority to, to manage the river. The Bureau, uh, they get the authority to allocate water uh, for irrigation projects and larger projects, but the Corps manages the river. And so if you want to build a river and you want access to it, you don't need a permit to take the water from the Corps. You don't need a Corps permit to take the water out of the river, but you certainly need a water uh, permit to cross their, their land to get to it. You know, they have a buffer of, of land in there. And you need a permit if you're going to build an extra index structure to take the water. Like the actual taking the water, the location of water is the state of North Dakota. So each year, twice a year, the Corps puts on an annual uh, operating plan. And this year was well, every year. It's in Bismarck. It just happened to be in November this year. Mike Gush, uh, our fellow who introduced us, he attended it and, and took notes and, and shared all his notes with us. Um, here's what the Corps is saying. And maybe Dr. Richardson talked about this. I didn't catch all his presentation. He's our weather guy, right? You know, North Dakota has been mean for El Nino. As last time we had an El Nino. El Nino, by the way, means we're going to have a warmer winter and a drier winter. Not only winter, but summer. The year is going to be warmer and drier. The last time we had an El Nino, and you look at my little table on the right, December and January, um, it shows you the temperatures and it shows you the entire season of snow. Well, in 2015 and 2016, we were almost 8 degrees warmer uh, on average. That's pretty significant. And the average snowfall for the area was 24 inches. Remember last year, we had almost 100 inches. So this year, we're in El Nino. So maybe this year, 24 inches. Maybe this year, 8 degrees warmer. That's what uh, NOAA, NOAA National Oceanographic uh, Atmospheric, I don't know, quote, I guess that's what stands for the, the, uh, the, weather, the weather people say it's going to be an El Nino. And that's through the whole Midwest, by the way. So Garrison Dam, what else do you put into it? Um, um, well, here's what else the Corps says. The Corps says that, uh, you know, the average flow past Bismarck is about 20,000. They're going to maintain that flow past Bismarck into the fall, and we're into the fall now. But when we get in early winter, they're going to drop that flow from about 22,000 to 17,000. You see my first two boats. So they're going to start, they're going to release less water to Garrison this year, which means they're going to raise the lake level in Garrison. Um, or they're going to try to raise the lake level, but even at that reduced from 22 to 17, I guess on this slope there, the lake levels are anticipated to fall um, about three to four feet. That, of course, opens up flood storage for the coming spring. Do they have good flood storage? Now you can't you can't predict a 2011 type of event, right? That's kind of a one or whatever. You can't you can't plan for that. But they're, to the extent that they can plan, they'll be ready for any type of spring flooding. Uh, you can't predict for uh, catastrophic rainfall events, uh, so that's not in the model. Uh, but all the other other authorized purposes, water supply, flood control, recreation, they're going to be met. The Corps said we'll meet those obligations in North Dakota. That's off Garrison Dam. Now, if you're down by Wahi Dam, it's kind of the same situation. They're going to drop the they're going to drop the release down a little bit from about 19.4, 15.7. The numbers don't maybe mean a lot, but they're going to drop the releases out of Wahi, um, and then that also they'll also drop the lake of Wahi. So if you live along the lake of Wahi, uh, you'll be down under 1,600 now. If you don't live there, that number doesn't mean anything to you. That's getting you know it's bringing the lake down, and that of course is to get ready for flood storage. Again, they say they're going to meet all the authorized purposes. Now, those authorized purposes apply to South Dakota, right, for the most part. So that's uh, my presentation. I kind of rushed through, but um, thank you very much. Thank you both for your presentations today. It's a lot of good information and a lot to digest. We do have some pre-planned questions for our presenters, but um, we are running a little short on time. So if anyone has any questions from the audience that you'd like to ask, we'd be happy to take those now so we can have a little discussion on those. Yes, I have a couple questions and uh, for, for both gentlemen. Can, would you briefly explain the omahoney Milken Amendment to the Flood Control Act of 1944? Uh, yeah, so uh, Wade, you've asked about what's called the Old Mahoney Milliken Amendment. Um, when the 44 Flood Control Act was being formulated, uh, we had two senators, one was from Wyoming, 
and one was from Colorado, and I don't recall, I think Omahoney was, it doesn't really matter, one was from Wyoming, one was from Colorado. Um, they insisted that the 44 Flight Control Act uh, had language in there that said that navigation interests could not uh, um, be more important, supersede the consumptive use of water in the upper basin states. In other words, the consumptive use for irrigation, they called it irrigation, municipal, and mining is what they said at the time. So consuming water in the upper basin would have a priority over running the river system for navigation. That's what Old Mahoney Milliken did. And you know, neither one of them, and that included irrigation, by the way, neither one of them were irrigators, and neither one of them, one was from Wyoming, and Wyoming didn't really have a big dog in the fight, and Colorado didn't, but certainly those two fellas did us a big favor in North Dakota by insisting that that amendment be put in. And by the way, it's not really an amendment because now it's embedded in the act. It's part B.1. If you ever want to pull up the 44 Flight Control Act, look at part B.1, and it very clearly says that you know, navigation does not take priority. In fact, it cannot take priority over the consumptive use of the upper basin state. So, Wade, I think that's the, the answer you probably uh, were looking for, weren't you? Yes, it was, and I think it's very important for the state of North Dakota to realize that what that amendment says and to remember it. And then, Clay, a couple of things. Uh, we conducted a water tour, Missouri River water tour, this last summer, and I asked the question, and I was quite surprised at the number of people that don't know the answer to the question, and that is the significance of the highway numbers of the two highways that parallel the Missouri River north and south all the way through North Dakota. So 1804 is the road on the right side of their ascent of the river. They left St. Louis on May 14, 1804, stopped in the Mandan villages for five months, and then uh, returned to the travels in 1805. And then 1806 is on the down uh, side of the river coming back. They got back to North Dakota on August 3rd, 1806, and they left the state forever on August 20th. So 1804, 1806 marked, and they usually have um, blue heart signs adjacent to them, but they marked the, 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 up, the up journey in 1804 and down journey in 1806. And then the other thing I was going to ask you is, uh, prior to the steamboats, you know, there was a, and prior to the fur traders, there, the Native Americans, in, from what I read, used the Missouri River quite extensively for, for, for trade as well. And it seems to me I read somewhere that the Flint in the uh, Knife River Indian villages near Stanton was a highly sought after trade item. And if I remember right, didn't they even find remnants of, the, of Knife River Flint in the lower Mississippi Valley? Yes, yeah, so the Knife River Flint quarries that are near Stanton um, you know, Hazen, Stanton, Washburn in that zone, the Knife River's name because of the flints that were made available there. So one of the, the greatest flint resources in North America was right here in, in the heart of North Dakota, and that's why the Knife got that name. And um, so those flints, you've probably seen them um, being manufactured at Fort Mandan or elsewhere. Um, those flints are world class, and they traveled all over. The Mandan Hidatsa villages were the centerpiece of an international trade network that extended all the way to the Yukon and Florida and from New Hampshire to California, extraordinary, and this is uh, this is the best flint source in the world in, in North America, right outside of Stanton. Thank you. I see a question there in the back. Thank you, uh, Clay. You mentioned uh, Senator Conrad's compensation to the um, Indian tribes in North Dakota, both Standing Rock and uh, three affiliated. Can you provide us a little bit of detail on that? What that uh, bill did. Uh, again, uh, that should, if, if anyone wants to have this handout with some book, but Coyote Warrior has an extensive account of that. So what happened was that um, the Senator Conrad and others, Byron Dorgan too, uh, got involved in this, and they were able to work out a, a, a compensation package that was initially around $175 million. So too little, too late, but very substantial financial uh, compensation. The MHA were, of course, glad for that. They were part of this, um, uh, the Cross family, Ray Cross and, and uh, Marilyn Hudson. That family is a very prominent MHA family. And they were heavily involved in the litigation and the public relations campaign to get uh, our delegation to side with, with, a, with a kind of ex post facto compensation package. And those uh, funds were, were invested in infrastructure uh, on, on the reservation. Um, the MHA are, are, are reasonably satisfied with that, but they also have interest in timber that promises not kept grazing lands, especially in drier years, promises not kept, and so on. So it's an ongoing struggle, but it's true that this was uh, 30 years ago now uh, that Ken Conrad was able to, to shoulder that through the United States Congress. But the book to read, again, is Andrew Elder's um, the Coyote Warrior. I want to thank you all today for coming to our presentation. Um, we are out of time. Um, I'd like to encourage you all to check out the Missouri River Joint Water Board um, EAE initiative. Um, it focuses on how we can work together to preserve our river and our rights to the river, and how we can work together to put our river to beneficial use and protect it from upstream and downstream states and countries, such as Canada, who are trying to um, claim a stake in the river that might take away our rights to that water. So thank you all today. I'm sure these two presenters will be around if you have any more questions. Thank you.
now it's uh, time here to change our focus just a little bit to cyber security awareness in water, the water industry. And here to expound on this topic is Matt Oderman. Matt is a cyber security instructor for several industry certifications in data processing, networking, cyber security. He serves as president of North Dakota Rural Water Association, board member for all season rural water use district, and is chairman of the commission for county counter. Matt. Hello, thank you to my rural water folks for welcoming me. We had worse, worse, and now worse this? Is that what's that word? I don't know. Um, my name is Matt Orman. I'm here today to talk a little bit about cybersecurity. I am ANSI. I move around a little bit, so I will not be behind the podium. Uh, Julie called and said, hey, would you present at the conference? I said, sure. She said, how about the last session of the afternoon right before social hour in a dimly lit room? And I said, sure, let's do it, right? Um, so let's see if I can figure out what I'm doing up here. Uh, a little bit about me. I am a board member of All Seasons Rural Water. President of the Rural Water, North Dakota Rural Water Association, excellent association, love it. Yeah, thanks Eric. Uh, I'm a county commissioner in Towner County. Um, I ran into Jim Schmidt, Representative Jim Schmidt, former. He's got a joke that I'm gonna borrow right now. What's the difference between a cactus and the county commission chambers? On the cactus, the pricks are on the outside. Okay, no. If you're elected person, you gotta, you gotta have thick skin, just relax a little bit. Um, my day job is I'm a cybersecurity instructor. Uh, I teach at uh, Turtle Mountain Community College, but I also serve a variety of other institutions. Um, and then I hold a variety of uh, industry certifications. So I know a little bit about water, a little bit about cybersecurity, I think. I'm not an expert on everything. I wish I was. A little housekeeping. I am German. I might mumble a little bit. I get excited. I spit. So you guys in the front, you've been warned. The Lutherans in the back, you're going to be OK, I think. All right? Um, what we're going to cover today is cybersecurity awareness, what it is, talk about passwords. We're going to talk about uh, ransomware attacks, firewalls. SCADA vendors, SCADA systems, some operational processes, and uh, you know what you do if you get hacked, real briefly on that, and then multi-factor authentication. So there's really going to be three things I want you to take away today, and I'll point those out. Um, Cybersecurity awareness, what does that mean? The um, way I describe it to people, it's a lot like winter driving in North Dakota. You plan your trip, you look at road reports, you look at weather reports, you bring warm clothes, you make sure your vehicle's ready to go. Same thing in your cyber uh, environment. You're thinking about what hazards might be out there, how you may be exposed, and what are you going to do if something happens, right? So that's what cybersecurity really is. Um, why is it important to the water industry? Uh, maybe some of you know about the city of Oldsmar, Florida, the cybersecurity event that they had. Um, Oldsmar is a town of about 15,000 people, and an operator was at work, and he was doing checking levels on chemicals in the water treatment plant, and he noticed one of them was, like, super high. And he went, that's kind of weird. I'm going to go change that back to where it's supposed to be. So he did that. About five minutes later, it was back up to a dangerous level again. He said, this ain't right. So he started alerting people, set it back down. They realized somebody had hacked their SCADA system. And was seeing sodium hydroxide, something, I don't know, water treatment stuff. But um, very serious event. It kicked off a lot of things nationally in the rural water. Uh, the EPA started getting involved with their cybersecurity rule that almost came into effect. Um, so it was kind of a pivotal thing. And it wasn't a huge water system like the city of New York. This was a fairly typical innocuous city that was hacked. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that here in a minute. Um, some of the basics, some of the terminology is digital footprint, you know, um, that is your footprint out in the digital sphere, right? Like all your accounts, all your information, uh, your cyber surface area is kind of a term that gets thrown around sometimes. Uh, that's your exposure to the world or to the internet uh, in my, my terms of thinking. Uh, your posture is how you're positioned to protect yourself against cyber attacks. And bottom line, most cybersecurity incidents come back to the simplest things. City of Oldsmar was a SCADA server that was put in two years beforehand. The SCADA vendor had installed some remote software on there. It never got updated, never got shut down. Two years later, no one exploits were out of there. Out of that, were exploited and hacked, right? Simple thing, keeping things up to date, on installing on new software, right? Uh, they didn't have any firewalls or anything like that in place as well, uh, but we'll talk about those things here in a sec. Uh, password reuse. This is one of the first things uh, I'm going to tell you, and if you've heard one of my presentations before, I talked about this, but uh, your email password, uh, you should not reuse that anywhere else. Uh, that's like one of the basic number one things you can do. And here's why. Say when you sign up for Netflix, for example, they ask you for your email, and that's your username. If you're, you reuse your password from your email there, now if Netflix has a data breach, that bad actor has your email password and pa or email and password. Now think of what you use your email for. Banking, insurance, 
right? Get password reset links sent to it. Get uh, security code sent to it. Can be uh, an escalation of issues for you. So number one thing, if you can not reuse passwords uh, that are the same as your email, that would be number one. Uh, complexity of your passwords, you know, typically you don't want complexity in your life, like your social situation, you don't want that to be complex, but your password is good, okay? Um, the recommendation is 12 characters length, um, use of upper and lower case, numbers, symbols. Um, there is one password that no one will ever guess. Um, I'm gonna tell you what it is right now. Don't tell anybody I told you this, but the one password nobody will guess is Viking Super Bowl victory, okay? So if that's your password, you'll be okay, all right? Um, there are a variety of uh, websites out there that warehouse data breach information. Um, I'm not gonna pitch one or the other, but if you do a, a simple Google search, uh, you can put your email in and see if it's been associated with a data breach that's been public uh, for a while. So can I get some information on that? That gives you an idea, do I need to change my password? Best practices for changing passwords, this has been debated here lately. It used to be you know, every 60, 90 days, 120 days. Uh, they say now, um, if you have a complex password, 12 characters or more, and it hasn't been part of a data breach, you don't have to change it. Which is kind of nice for the average person. Um, there are uh, password managers out there. I'm not gonna recommend one, because I did one time, and like two weeks later it was hacked, so I'm not doing that again. Um, but there are password managers out there. It's like a one-stop shop to store all your passwords uh, to a fairly high degree of, of security, uh, so you can have different passwords for 50 different states and manage them appropriately. Um, that's one option. But again, don't reuse your email password with any other account. Pretty simple stuff, I get it. Uh, ransomware attacks, uh, what, what they are is uh, a bad actor installs uh, some encryption software on your PC or your server, encrypts your data, and says, all right, if you went back, pay me two Bitcoin or whatever. Um, this is probably the most common attack on small organizations, like small rural water districts or small counties. Um, generally, uh, they can be pretty disruptive if you don't have backups of your stuff. Um, if you have no plan to respond, and I'm not talking about a full-blown incident response plan, I'm, I'm talking about maybe just having a conversation with somebody like, what do I do if my SCADA server completely is destroyed? How do I get back up online? That's a question you should be talking about in your organizations. Um, a lot of, uh, it's really disruptive if you don't have any support in place. Um, you should be working with your SCADA vendors, you should be working with some sort of ID support. So if you do encounter an attack or a ransomware attack, you at least have a phone number or somebody to call to help you through that. Start the process of getting back on your feet again. Um, this is one of the easier things to prevent. Um, it's one of the easier things to recover from if you have those backups and processes in place. But if you don't, it can be devastating. Uh, it's happened to a rural water district in the state. I know that. Um, it's happened to a rural health care center in this state. It was very devastating to them. Um, think about keying in medical records on paper and not in your computer system. No. Pretty complicated. Uh, how do you? Prevent ransomware attacks, one is training with your staff and yourself. Uh, the other is a properly configured firewall, which I'll talk about here in a sec, and then good digital hygiene. Don't click on that win a free iPad type of thing, okay? Um, you won't win it. So with firewalls, um, make sure you work with professional services on this. Um, I do a, a hacking demonstration presentation, and I, I go out just on the internet, and I, find, I can find 50, uh, firewalls that are improperly configured or managed, um, that have no one exploits out there. Uh, so make sure when you deploy a firewall on your network, which is your route firewall, they're often very folded together now, uh, you work with a professional service like uh, High Point Networks or Marco Technologies. There's tons of them out there that are very capable of setting it up for you, configuring it correctly, managing it, making sure that it's up to date, all those things. Um, when evaluating vendors, like if you're looking at an IT group or your SCADA group, um, this is something I feel very passionately about is they should be able to explain to you in plain terms what they can do for you. They shouldn't confuse you. They can not try to scare the bejesus out of you. They should be able to articulate what you're paying for, what kind of protection they can give you. If they can't, move on to the next one because there's plenty of them out there. Um, firewalls, you know, they provide that baseline protection to your network. Uh, they have logging capabilities. They have all kinds of security services on them. Uh, intrusion protection, gateway antivirus, all these things that probably don't mean a lot to you, but they're very good things to keep your network protected. And all, it's all in one device, can be easily managed. Um, and then also that VPN connection, so you can remote in. I know there's some water, water managers here that are already checking their water levels on their phone right now. Probably very. Yep, okay, good. Um, so firewall properly configured is number two, okay? There will be a review. I am an instructor, I have to do a review at the end. Um, SCADA. I was just looking at one of the vendors out there looking through their, their management system for irrigation. I didn't see one thing on security in it. 
being a paranoid cybersecurity guy, I would never go with that platform. But um, if your SCADA or ICS vendor has no plan for cyber defense in their system, that's not good, okay? It should be top of mind. Um, they should be able to articulate and explain to you what they're doing to keep their system safe. And again, they should be able to do that in a way that you can understand it. And uh, they shouldn't try to scare you into spending money, okay? Um, I'm not a fan of that as, as well. Um, uh, be, keep in mind that it's not just one small part. Your ICS is a part of your security uh, posture. It's your financial software. A lot of times they interact with, the, with each other, the interface. Um, so if you had an exploit in your financial software that affected your ICS, they're just going to blame each other, right? So you need to make sure uh, you're taking it as a whole, working with all your vendors on your cybersecurity. Um, I threw one little bullet point in here on risk transference. This is for managers and board members out here. When you're evaluating your budget policies, um, you know you have to accept a certain amount of risk in cyber. You know that your manager is never going to give up that remote connection to their SCADA equipment. You know that our customers are probably not going to want to give up paying their bill online. So you're going to have some exposure, you're going to have to accept some risk. And at that point, um, you want to engage your insurance company and have uh, some coverage on that. Um, it's not terribly expensive. They do set up some compliance things for you, but most of you are probably already following that. Um, so something to think about at your board meetings. Make sure you're covered. Um, Operational processes, this is another issue with City of Oldsmar. They use a shared username and password for everybody that logged into the system. Okay, um, I'm sure there's water systems out there that do the same thing right now. Uh, but it should be role-based, right? Like your standard operator should only have access to certain privileges. The manager might have access to more, so on and so forth. Uh, the nice thing about that is for auditing. So say David you know, made a change in uh, a pump or something. It would log in there saying Dave made the change to Reservoir 8 Pump 2. I don't know. However, you guys talk as water operators. But uh, then also, if you can get this in your systems, this isn't always available, is privilege escalation within your programs, especially SCADA. For example, everyone logs in initially as a user, basic user. They can read and see data. But if they're going to make a change to a chemical level, they have to escalate with a different credential. Now, what does this prevent? If somebody was to hack Dave's basic user info, they can't really do anything of substance in your system. Something to visit about with your vendors. Again, there's logging and alerting. If you can send up alerting, that's great, especially after hours. Um, so say you got an alert saying Dave made a change to this chemical level, and it's 3 in the morning, right? Like why would anybody be making changes at 3 in the morning, for example? So logging, alerting, also very easy things that your IT support can implement for you. And then you should have policies and procedures in place. Everybody loves those two words, right? Policies and procedures, but uh, a lot of organizations don't have a policy for when uh, an employee leaves the organization, who's responsible for shutting down all their credentials and their access. So very simple, you know, mechanical thing that you guys have to take care of. Okay, so you were hacked. First thing you do, hit the panic button, okay? Pull your hair if you have some. Sorry, Dave. Um, no, I I'm kidding. Uh, Hopefully you have some sort of delineated response plan if you do have a, an incident. Um, again, that doesn't have to be a formal plan. That can be a list of numbers and uh, resources that you have available to you to call to get some assistance. Um, that's the big thing. I bet if some of you said, who do I call if my server goes down? Uh, is it my ICS guy? Is it my IT support group? You know, you should have them know who you're gonna call. Now, when do you inform law enforcement of a cybersecurity incident? This is a question I had last time. And um, for sure, if it's a public safety event, uh, like City of Oldsmore, that definitely was, was reported to law enforcement. Anytime uh, the health or safety of people is at stake, definitely report it to law enforcement. Uh, North Dakota is very, very uh, robust in their cybersecurity program with North Dakota ITD. And then also with the North Dakota State and Local Intelligence Center, or North Dakota SLIC. Now, you can only imagine the type of people that sit down in a dungeon and research cybersecurity incidents. But they're professionals from all over the state. They're tremendous individuals. That's a free resource. If you do get hacked, you can work with them. They can provide a bunch of data and a bunch of info to you. Uh, North Dakota BCI is another one that if it's serious enough, they will help with that investigation. And your local law enforcement should be able to start the process for you as well. Now, the financial law piece of this is, uh, has to be pretty significant before you can get law enforcement uh, resources. But uh, those are two events that for sure you should probably report to law enforcement. And it's not meant to be embarrassing because it happens all the time. Right? Um, so don't feel like you, you're doing something wrong if you report it. Last thing is multi-factor authentication. I think the education on this is out there now. This is one of the most effective things you can do. It interacts with virtually every software, every system now, every new 
uh, piece of software uh, allows this interaction. Uh, it uh, is very easy to implement. Uh, if you don't know what multi-factor authentication is, if you've ever logged into your bank account and you put your username and password and then it sends you a text message with a code, that's multi-factor. So multi-factor is something you know, which is your username and password, or something you have, like a token or a passcode that's sent to you, or something you are, which would be fingerprints, retinal scan, or hopefully not in our case, Dave, uh, facial recognition, right? Um, I'm picking on Dave because he's president, all right? Um, work with your vendors. They should be able to incorporate that with all of your, uh, all of your systems for you. Um, Dave told me I had to cut out 100 slides, so I'm down to 12 today, all right? Um, just in closing, uh, again, there's three things for sure that I would tell you, um, again, take away from this presentation today. I'm not one that uh, bores you for 45 minutes. No offense to anybody else that presented in this conference, but I try to keep it short to the point. I want to give you something that you can take with you. And again, the first thing is, do not reuse your email password anywhere else. Please don't do that. You stop escalation of a hack tremendously when you do that. Tremendously, assert it's only Donald Trump up here now. Um, properly configured firewall, properly configured and managed. Again, I'll say that one more, properly configured. If you think you know how to configure it, probably not. Okay, engage uh, professional services on that. Um, Multi-factor authentication, which we just talked about. Um, again, those three things will eliminate roughly 80, 90, 90% of your issues. And they're not terribly hard to implement. Now with the firewall, there is some cost. Multi-factor authentication, depending on what service you use, can be some cost, um, but it's, it's well worth that. Um, sorry I picked on Lutheran today. Uh, you guys in the back, I hope you had something out of it. Sorry, Dave, I picked on you as well. Um, with that, I'm going to be done unless you have some questions for me. Yes? Uh, just uh, a question. I'm not sure if I posed this to you in the past, but what's your thoughts? Because it seems like when I go online, you know, they're always doing something where it kind of sends a signal, like a facial recognition thing. But is that part of that multi-factor multi authentication? Multi-factor yeah. multi authentication? Is yes. that what that is? Yeah. Okay. Do you think that's a, a fairly solid safeguard you know, for cybersecurity? Or? Um, yes, I think it's more effective than, and more secure than the, the text message that gets sent to you because there can be the SIM card in there can be cloned, right? So people can duplicate what's sent to you pretty quickly. Um, I did bring my a hacker big with me who has the thing. I was trying to get Dave to let me scan his credit card earlier, but he wouldn't do it. But uh, facial recognition, 100% is a little better than that. Uh, I know that NSA is working on a quick DNA thing now, which is insane to me. Um, read a little bit about that. Um, but with um, facial recognition, what's getting really interesting is uh, with AI, um, they can start to pick out different sections of people's faces for that. And, you know, uh, that's kind of a scary thing. I don't want to think anybody wants to duplicate my face, but dang it, you know, maybe they do. But does that answer your question, Doug? Thanks. Who's ready for social hour up there? Okay. Oh, Mary. All right. Absolutely, Mary. Okay, so you're talking, how about on a per, not a business level, but a personal level in your home? Do we still need? Do I know enough to um, configure my own firewall? Is that a smart thing to do or shouldn't I? And, you know, my other question would be on all the uh, multi-factor authentication, there's all these apps for that, whether it be Google or, do, you know, mm -hmm. there's a bunch of them. Is one better than the other or do you recommend any of those to be using on an everyday basis? Okay, answer your first question. If you're an average user at home, I'd work with your internet service provider. Most local telcos in this state have managed routers, firewalls that they lease to you. It's five, six dollars a month or something like that. Um, those are well managed. They have security assessments done on them all the time. They're kept up to date. And that would be my recommendation for a normal user. Mary, on what? You could, um, if you trust yourself. Um, yeah, I, there's some people I wouldn't trust doing that. Uh, I would trust you, Mary. Okay, your second question, which one's better as far as multi-factor authentication? Um, I don't know if there's one better than the other because there's Google Authenticator, Microsoft has one, there's one log, there's all kinds of them. It's uh, whether that's gonna, whatever one's gonna work best with all your systems. If you can get one that works with all your systems, that would be the one that would go with. Multi-factor authentication? Absolutely, I would have that be a requirement to sign into your email, to your SCADA system, to your VPN. Uh, all, all those things for sure, for sure. 
I, I got a question. Why are we seeing a lot more of these I am not a robot on websites nowadays and then you have to through and pick out the fire hydrant or the motorcycle or whatever? Sure, sure. So the CAPTCHAs? So the CAPTCHAs are there to prevent like, so the very sophisticated people are able to uh, brute force attack and do multiple logins, right? And so that can be a computer system running these route logins against the system and trying a bunch of different password combinations. So they want to make sure that you're human and humans can read and look and pick uh, out. I always screw it up. And I also like the one that you can't read, too. I don't get that, but yeah, that's what that's for. Good questions. Well, I didn't get up here long enough to wear a hole in the, in the stage today, but if not, thank you, and uh, hopefully you got something out of it. Today. Thanks again, Matt, for uh, an interesting presentation. It's a topic that we all need to learn about. Uh, there's some announcements I need to make before we close for the, this afternoon. We need, I want to thank you for your attendance today, but before we close, let's give our sponsors one more thank you. And this year's conference sponsors are Water Champions, AE2S, Houston Engineering, Moore Engineering, The Water Partner, is Apex Engineering, Bar Engineering, Bartlett West, Bismarck Mandan Convention and Visitor Bureau, Devil's Lake Joint Water Resource Board, Ellingson, and Hess Corporation. Our water supporters are Ag Country Farm Credit Services and Farm Credit Services of Mandan, Dakota Supply Group, Dwyer Law Offices, PLLC, HDR, Minnesota Valley Irrigation out of Bismarck, Man Montana Dakota Utilities, North Dakota Rural Water Systems Association, Onset Twitchell PC, and Vogel Law Offices. And before we wrap it up, I have some announcements for you. The Final Resolutions Committee meeting will be downstairs starting at 5 o'clock. Tonight, the social starts at 5.30 in the courtyard, and the awards banquet will begin at 6.30 in the Grand Pacific Room. Entertainment will be provided by the Strolling Strings and Junior Strolling Strings, and I look forward to seeing you this evening. Thank you for your, your time. When I wake up, well, I know I'm going to be, I'm going to be the man who thinks I'm next to you. When I go out, yeah, I know I'm going to be, I'm going to be the man who goes along with you. If I get on, well, I know I'm going to be, I'm going to be the man who gets drunk next to you. And if I hate my, yeah, I know I'm going to be, I'm going to be the man who's evil to you. But I would walk 500 miles and I would walk 500 more Hi, everyone. They need to flip this room for the banquet, so if I can ask you just to go in the hallway.